Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak with you today briefly on the role of the National Institutes of Health Research in addressing COVID-19. As I mentioned to this committee in a prior hearing, the NIH and NIAID has a four-part strategic plan for research to address COVID-19. The first is to improve the fundamental knowledge of the virus itself, viral biology, and the clinical manifestations resulting from infection. We have continued to push the frontier of understanding this virus, particularly with regard to the conformational structure of the spike protein, which serves as the basis for all of the vaccines that are being pursued now, which I'll get to in a moment. In addition, there have been a number of important clinical observations that we will be pursuing in the future. I bring to your attention the fact that a number of individuals who virologically have recovered from infection, in fact, have persistence measured in weeks to months of symptomatology that does not appear to be due to persistence of the virus. They're referred to as long haulers. They have fatigue, myalgia, fever, and involvement of the neurological system, as well as cognitive abnormalities, such as the inability to concentrate. In addition, we found to our dismay that a number of individuals who have completely recovered and apparently are asymptomatic when they have sensitive imaging technologies such as magnetic resonance imaging or MRI have found to have a disturbing number of individuals who have inflammation of the heart. These are the kind of things that tell us we must be humble and that we do not completely understand the nature of this illness. Next, with regard to diagnostics, you know we have the Radex protein, uh, a program that is going to, in the next several months, allow us to have a considerable number of point of care testing. Moving on to therapeutics, I mentioned to this committee some time ago that the NIH put together an expert panel for treatment guidelines, which is a living document that reviews the literature as well as the areas of expertise that are pre-publication to help clinicians throughout the world to address the clinical components of this outbreak. I must tell you that as of last night, there have been 4.5 million views of this treatment guideline, so it clearly is helping people throughout the world. I want to mention two of the drugs that have actually now be part of, the, of these guidelines. Remdesivir, which you've heard about, has been shown in a randomized placebo-controlled trial to diminish the time to recovery in individuals who are hospitalized who have lung disease. In addition, dexamethasone, a commonly used steroid, has been shown in a randomized placebo-controlled trial involving more than 6,000 individuals, has been shown to clearly and significantly reduce the 28-day mortality. In addition, there are a number of other treatments including antiviral convalescent plasma, which is still being tested in randomized controlled trials. And you mentioned appropriately and correctly that we feel optimistic about monoclonal antibodies, which are currently being tested in an outpatient setting, in an inpatient setting, family prophylaxis, which means when an individual in a given family gets infected, if you give monoclonal antibodies to the rest of the family, can you prevent the spread within the family unit and finally, nursing home prophylaxis. As you mentioned, there are three companies involved in this. And finally, and importantly, the issue of vaccine. We have put together what's called a strategic approach to COVID vaccine development. As you mentioned, Mr. Chairman, there are six companies that the federal government is playing a role in either helping to develop, subsidizing, or supporting the clinical trials. We're harmonizing the trials so that information from one can be applicable to another. Currently, there are three uh, platform candidate vaccines that have entered into phase three trial. Very soon, there will be a fourth. As I mentioned to this committee, we feel cautiously optimistic that we will be able to have a safe and effective vaccine, although there is never a guarantee of that Early studies in animals and in human phase one and phase two indicate that individuals induce a response that is comparable to, if not better, than natural infection. And so as these trials go on, we predict that sometime by the end of this year, let's say November or December, we will know whether or not these are safe and effective. And as you mentioned, Mr. Chairman, right now, 
doses of this vaccine are being produced so that they'll be ready to be distributed. I'll close with the comment that we, we feel strongly that if we have a combination of adherence to the public health measures together with a vaccine that will be distributed to people in this country and worldwide, we may be able to turn around this terrible pandemic that which we have been experiencing.